Before what we knew as this shattered realm called Outland, there was this world called Draenor. It was this wild, primeval landscape populated by all manner of creatures, including, of course, the, the brown orcs of Draenor. We originally were thinking about this as a council of the clans, where you would have um, the different orc clans meet to elect their first war chief. They would be forced to make a choice about, you know, which way they were going to go. Would they side with these demon lords, or would they go their own way? And then this mysterious cloaked figure would arrive, and he would punch out Blackhand, and he would maybe choke out Gul'dan, and, and throw out the cloak and reveal himself to be Garrosh, this amazing orc from the future. And we were thinking, well, that's cool, but couldn't we be more expansive? Couldn't we find a way to make this bigger break out? We kind of moved in completely away from the direction of where we were and reapproached it with this idea of being upon the throne of Kil'jaeden. All the clans were being brought here to basically give fealty to Gul'dan's poison. So Gul'dan is able to get the different horde leaders to uh, drink the blood of the demons, right? And that way they would become what was known as the horde. They were deceived by the Burning Legion when they made that blood pact, which turned their skin green and their eyes red. You know, if only they had known, right, what uh, the, the blood of Manoroth would actually do to them. But actually, somebody does know. Garrosh, the war criminal, the outcast, who hates all the races of Azeroth and wishes in his darkest of hearts that things had gone very differently and that the orcs of Draenor had followed a different path. Knowing what you know now, you know, how would you go back and do things differently? And how would you kind of help steer history in a different direction? And so the opportunity to kind of go back to this time and this place where their whole destiny, the whole destiny of their culture is really at this fulcrum point, um, felt really, really good to us as storytellers. Um, it felt like it cut right to the roots um, of what the Warcraft franchise has been all about. You will all be conquerors. And what, Gul'dan, must we give in return? Everything. Gul'dan is a guy that will go to any length um, and sacrifice anyone around him um, to gain power. It's not about hating other people. It's not about, uh, you know, some civilization or some other person had done him wrong. It's all just stepping stones to attain power and just ascend out of this doldrum existence, I'm sure, that he sees it as. So Garrosh was an orc that was raised in, in Outland. And so he's heard the history of the orcs and he's heard what's happened, you know, to, the, to all of his people. I think from a very early age, this started to boil in him, this resentment of the Legion and this feeling that things should have been different. I think he started to see that the complexities of the modern horde, right, with all these different races, and trolls and tauren and goblins and things like that, he just, he just didn't get it. I don't get it, the horde, I grew up with all these stories it's about orcs, it's about orcish identity, it's about orcish dominance, right? Isn't, isn't that who we are? I think it's probably when Garrosh is sitting in that jail cell in Manacles awaiting his sentence that this starts to boil up in him. Again, this resentment for the way things turned out for the orcs on Azeroth. And couldn't things be different? I believe that when he went to the past and he was able to make contact with certain of these old chieftains, he fell deeply in love again with this sense of like the orcish ideal. Gromash Hellscream being his father was certainly an easy target for Garrosh to, to be able to appeal to. And his father was this hugely important character in the early days of the Horde. So not a lot is known really about how Garrosh went about contacting Gromash and exactly what he said to Gromash to change his mind and you know get him to lead him down the path. And it's really going to be interesting for players to, as they adventure through Draenor, kind of uncover what happened and uncover what's happened as a result of this change in traditional history. Drink, Hellstream. We started thinking about Manoroth, and you know, in the literature, he isn't present at this ceremony, at this blood pact. But we started thinking, that doesn't mean that he wasn't there. Maybe he's like using fell magic to cloak himself, to, to hide himself. And so then the Hellscream's plan started to emerge that maybe what they needed to do uh, was to openly defy uh, Gul'dan and Manoroth by pouring out the blood, by not drinking from the cup, and make the demon show himself and then take that guy down. Reach 
reject this gift. We felt like that the, the sort of whimsical design approach that worked so well for Pandaria probably was the wrong fit for this one. And this one, we needed to go photo real. We just really needed to make you believe as much as possible that you were looking at real creatures. And that comes, you know, at a price. I mean, it is extremely intensive to get in there and really make skin look like real skin and sweat look like real sweat. The thing about CG is you can run into the uncanny valley very quickly, right? But I think what we call hyper-realism is something that our fans really enjoy. You know, we don't use a lot of motion capture, if at all, any. And I think a lot of that is really to create a sense of fantasy. So another big challenge uh, for us was Hellscream and things uh, that have changed from his first inception to this particular rendition of him was he's brown, right? We've only seen him with green skin. When we revisited him here, we knew that this was going to be before he had been corrupted. And so, you know, uh, you know, talking to Chris Metzen, talking to Robinson, a lot of the ideas that were floating around the table is that these guys are more um, Mongolian, a little bit more feral, more furs, a little bit more of the Conan sort of vibe. We kind of abandoned the old orc and brought out the new and started focusing on what would this a lot grittier, a lot more tangible orc look like. And that's where we landed in. Um, is definitely by far the most scary orc we've ever done in cinematics. The three orcs really needed to be very distinct, especially Gromash and Garrosh. You know, you needed to really understand that they were different characters, but also little hints in there of the lineage because they are father and son, whether they know it or not at this point. I especially like some of the parts of Gul'dan's face. We spent a lot of time with his upper lip, really focusing on like how much the demon blood has really changed him over time. Some of these characters are from the past, certainly, but we needed to re-envision them in a way that they could emote and really convey real action and real um, depth to their characters. So we had to break down their face from a completely different standpoint. So that was the balance, was to make them recognizable, but also to bring them uh, you know, up to speed in terms of 21st century CG. With Manoroth, uh, maybe more so than some of the other characters, we had to walk a very fine line between um, up his design with today's tools while still living up to the essence of what Manoroth is and make, keeping him recognizable. There's a lot of things we probably could have updated from a, from a design standpoint, but in, in many ways we had to respect uh, the Manoroth and what people remember him to be. When you look at the two characters, they're obviously you know, mirror images of each other, but with subtle changes enough to where the fan who's really paying attention will notice the huge difference. And did you bring these mongrels here just to watch you die? The point that Garrosh concludes is he's got to stop Gul'dan, and that this curse will not happen, and that the orcs will not turn green, they will not gain super strength and resiliency, they will not become effectively Hulk-like monsters. He's got to give them an edge. Garrosh brings back this concept of a siege engine. Um, it seemed very natural for him to bring these present-day ideas into the past um, to augment um, the Iron Horde as he sees it um, and account for the lack of, you know, physical strength that they would have had um, if they had drank the blood of Manoroth. And as the expansion continues, that concept of the siege engine will start making its way into all of their weapons until, you know, it is sort of the, the heart of their uh, weapons technology. And then from that conceptual platform, really looking at Gromash, right? You know, which way will he go? You know, is there a noble heart in there? And he could be a great hero and a great leader of his people? Or is there just something broken in these Hellscream guys that when pressed, you know, become monstrous with or without demon blood flowing in their veins? When you're developing a story, there's always a lot of ideas that uh, don't get used. Like, for example, we really thought for a long time that it was very important for Gul'dan to be seen drinking the potion and to see his skin turning green. Cut to his hand slamming the cup down. His hand is shaking with strain as his fingers turn from brown to green. And this fell magic is like roiling off of his hand as he pulls it back. He pulls it up to just you know, revel in the power that he's been given and we cut in a close-up of his eye just flares red. And it's just funny how it's not until you try it editorially till you cut that out and you go, huh, no, actually, I don't need it at all. I think some of the more uh, loyal fans, if they knew only what got cut, they'd be like, why? We cut to a dagger 
slicing through skin and the big drum is sliced right open and out comes Ballista Jr. <laughs> right? Boom, boom, firing chain shot. The chains hurtle through the air. They stab the wall behind Manoroth, chaining him to the wall. Uh, one of the ideas that we had was behind him, um, rising from the cliffs is Zeppelins. And on the deck of the Zeppelins is, you know, the goblin captain. And it's sort of like hovering above Manoroth. And what they're doing is firing chain harpoons into him. Um, he's getting pinned, but he's grabbing the chains and pulling down the Zeppelins. They're going up in smoke. No matter how much we want to tell the 60 minute long version of it, at the end of the day, it's got to fit in about four minutes. You know, sometimes you say, well, I can't use it, but it was still a good idea. The demon pulls back, roars, reels back, blast of light coming out of his head. Uh-oh, it looks like history's gonna repeat itself. One of the ideas that sprung up from our early story discussions with our storyboard artists and, and Taryn and myself um, was the idea of doing an homage to the original Warcraft 3 movie. This is an opportunity to do something really interesting from a time travel perspective. We thought, well, how exciting would it be if we literally staged the shot the way it went down the first time, right? So that people who are familiar with the Warcraft cinematic look at it and go, oh my god, it's the same composition, it's the same moment. History is going to repeat itself, but not this time. Without words, uh, without narration, the visual storytelling um, just really um, said it all, um, exactly what is happening, that history has changed. <clears throat> this was not our destiny. Times change. This was actually challenging, you know, because compared to other projects, this is a little tighter in schedule. It took almost 12 months from beginning to the end. So we have to uh, come out with a little bit uh, creative uh, about the scheduling. We had four hero characters. We had a host of background characters. We had a very expansive environment. We had a lot of effects. We had a lot of explosions. We had the blood. And also, we didn't have a full uh, solid concept at the beginning. So we have to ask modeling team to do sort of 3D concepting. Warlords of Drainer has a couple of really good effects. We wanted to spend some time on small effects this time, but make them very, very detailed. Essentially, we, we always begin uh, from the, the animatics, trying to figure out the, the overall destruction uh, that they're interested in, because uh, usually this sort of thing has a very specific kind of cadence and timing, kind of hitting the beats, and the sort of things that if this was practical, you'd have a whole army of folks figuring out uh, charges and when to detonate things. We pretty much do the exact same thing, only digitally. What we used for reference for these uh, actually was uh, Monty Python's uh, Flying Circus, where they're doing the bit with uh, how not to be seen, you know? You see a bush there, and then it goes off in a fireball. This is what just happened to be on my mind at the time. For the fire that's on the ground, we actually looked at a lot of reference and for the scale of the fires that we wanted, because fire looks very different at different scales and at different times of day and at different exposure settings for the camera. So actually what we did was we looked at um, cars that were on fire, shot at night, because it was about the right scale, about the right speed, and it had about the right camera exposure. One of my favorite effects was the plasma blast. We did tons of different concepts for this. We did versions that were smokier and versions that were fierier. That was a lot of fun, because we had never seen a demon plasma blast before, so we got to sort of concept it all from the start. There's the blood of Manoroth. We had a very close-up shot of that. We wanted to make sure that you understood that this was something evil. To create the believable blood, again, I think it's, it's a couple things. One is getting the simulation such that it is giving you that full three-dimensional motion, which gives the right viscosity and the right shapes, either as something is being poured or is dripping. Uh, and then the second thing is uh, having it uh, smear and adhere onto a surface, which, again, we I did kind of a, a hybrid technique where one set of simulation techniques for flowing blood and the other for anything that's adhering to the surface and dripping on it. Also, we film a lot of reference in order to get an idea for how we'll do the acting. Making these movies is a lot of sitting in front of computers, so uh, we try to make things analog whenever we can, and it's a great way to generate ideas because it's very fast, it's very cheap, and we're not worrying about lighting or, or the look of anything. It's all just about performance and character and story. <laughs> 
One of the differences between uh, Miss Pandera and, and uh, Warlords is that we changed our tech for what we were using for hairs. Before, for instance, on the panda, we almost had individual hairs that were sculpted by an artist, like to the level where maybe every 12 hairs were basically controlled as individual pieces. So it was just kind of untenable, and the size of our files were huge and blew up because we, we didn't have a nice procedural. So then when we switched to XGen, they basically sculpt one hair, and that account for a few hundred. We have spent more time on this show thinking about how characters in the show flex and show off the way that they're moving, especially with Gramash, who has to be this strong leader. So we spent probably about six weeks developing all the different muscle groups, from biceps to triceps to pec muscles, even down into his neck tendons as they fire off in different parts. Altogether, I think we have almost 200 maps that are dedicated to firing off muscles on different parts of his body. The biggest challenges for us were it diving into these characters and truly digging out these smaller features, making sure that all of those muscles are firing in symphony, that you understood exactly what the character was feeling before he even says it. And it was a huge undertaking between animation and, and prod tech, our rigging team and our R&D department to put together this new face rig. And I think it really shows we're able to do more with the face than we've ever done before. Lighting needs to almost be invisible uh, in ways that it actually carries the story forward, but you don't realize that it's doing it. And a lot like music does, where it can subtly kind of come in and just carry you into a, a mood. For this particular scene, we had an interesting color palette. We have the blue moonlight is pretty dominant, but then you have firelight, right? And blue and the firelight work pretty well together, moonlight and firelight. Um, then you throw in the green light of the blood pools and Manoroth himself. We wanted to avoid in most shots all three because uh, we wanted to just concentrate on two at least in each shot. But we try not to connect the lights. So anytime we're lighting a character, we always try to have the core shadow breaking up two of the tones. We don't want two tones touching each other. The large scale environments are the difficult ones because we're so used to seeing uh, things that are uh, in reality outside. So eye is really quick and our brain really picks up what is fake and what is real. So a lot of elements have to be created to push the realism of it and to get that believability in the shot. And we knew early on that the dark portal had to feel absolutely massive and everything else had to support the, the hero character, which is the dark portal. So everything had to drive that idea. We lit this shot mostly dark and until the portal is revealed, we have that nice dramatic lighting to push the idea of the dark portal. It is very conceivable that if the Iron Horde gets their dark portal finished on Draenor, that they could come through into our Azeroth and really cause us some trouble. Warcraft is just this big moving thing and there's just so many little pockets and nooks and crannies of, of content that can still come forward and be relevant. It's so much fun. It's just such a trip, you know, after all this time to see these ideas being vital. It's just been a pleasure to take this journey uh, back in time to revisit these classic Warcraft characters and situations and also to introduce them to a new generation of players. It brought back a lot of nostalgia for us getting to use these characters again that were really not that much more than just entries in the back of a manual, you know, in, in, in those first Warcraft games and to get to dimensionalize them in their culture and this moment in history has been uh, thrilling. We will never be slaves!